Um, so my aim today is to present how the Victorian grains industry collaborates to detect exotic incursions as well as provide area freedom information for market access. So I suppose the first question is why do we actually need a biosecurity uh, network? Um, Australia's broadacre grain production was worth over $11.5 billion in um, 2015 and this was sort of an average season average season within um, Victoria, that's why um, I chose these figures. Um, and Victoria's uh, alone was worth 1.8 billion um, during that year. A large part of Australia's grain is exported and maintaining market access um, is vital for our industry. So with exotic diseases that can reduce yield by uh, over 50% or um, cause major trade restrictions, we need a way to protect the industry. And this includes proving to our export markets that Victoria does not have any diseases of concern present in broadacre crops. And this includes um, domestic borders as well. So in order to achieve this, Victoria started the CropSafe program in 2017, uh, 2007. The idea was quite simple. Industry would collaborate and uh, submit samples throughout the growing season um, to state-based plant pathologists. They would then diagnose this pest or disease and um, provide information back, and then at the end of the season, industry would provide the area of crops that they actually surveyed for this, so that the area of freedom could be calculated. It sounds really simple, but if you actually have the whole industry sending in samples, this can actually become a huge workload. Um, so they needed to have a system um, to filter samples so that there wouldn't be a too big a number coming in. So this is how the actual network um, works. You have your farmer, um, sometimes a junior advisor as well, they find an unknown pest or disease. They then actually give this to someone who's part of this network and if they're able to diagnose this, they give a report back um, and they're able to manage the pest. Um, this also means that it's not an exotic. If they're not able to identify it um, or if they suspect it's an exotic, it gets passed on to the state-based pathologist. These are based out at Horsham. This is a small team of, specialised, um, uh, of specialists um, within endemic diseases. And if this is identified in Horsham, then the sample um, gets reported back to the uh, uh, CropSafe advisor, and that information goes back to the grower, and then you can have management advice around that. If, however, they suspect that it's actually an exotic, or they suspect, uh, or they don't know what the identification of it is, it goes to a specialised lab in Melbourne, who have taxonomic specialists and they also have access to molecular tools that aren't available in Horsham. If they conclude that it's not exotic um, or they identify what it is, they send the information back to um, the pathologist in Horsham who then notifies the CropSafe agronomist and this then goes back to the farmer. Now the situation we don't want is when that it's actually identified as an exotic because then the um, Chief Plant Health Officer in Victoria has to be notified um, and an action plan developed. Um, I have it on reasonably good information that there's a small group of people in Horsham that may also be going on leave at the same time. So we have this um, filtering system for these samples and then um, because it's a well-established uh, project, we know that um, where our agronomists are actually based and so with the red dots here on the map, you can actually see how far this network has, is spread throughout Victoria. The areas where there's no red dots are actually non-productive um, uh, areas where there's no broad acre cropping. And you can see circled in green, that's where Horsham is. So we're right smack bang in the middle of this region. The other question that people have often asked is, okay, so you've got a network, um, you have this process um, whereby people can send in samples, but how do you actually get information out of these advisors at the end of the season? They're busy people. So we actually provide them with other benefits um, than just diagnostic support. The diagnos diagnostic support is a key benefit for them, but we also provide them um, with regular training. So every three years we run a theory intensive um, disease identification and management training um, with the state experts. And in, in between years we also um, run field days where we mix disease ID training uh, to increase and um, maintain their skills as well. So this includes um, learning in a classroom style um, where samples with near perfect disease symptoms are placed in front of them, as well as them taking them out to field trials where they get that mix of disease symptoms and different pests and they can really actually start to figure out um, what they're looking for. 
So the idea here being, if you can identify it, then you can manage it, and we're providing you with additional support to this. So in addition, um, we're also able to provide them with in-season disease management options based on the samples they're actually sending in to us. So if we can see a spike in a certain disease, we can actually go, right, we've got access to all your email addresses, we can send you out some information on where we're seeing this and what you need to do to manage it. So based on this, you can see we actually provide a lot of training opportunities in endemic diseases. And the question is always, can advisors actually identify exotic diseases? Um, and we weren't actually sure about this. Until we hit um, 2016 and we had an incursion of Russian reed aphid. So our agronomist, uh, in our, an agronomist in our uh, network was actually the first person to identify Russian reed aphid in Victoria. They submitted the sample through our system um, and we were able to get a positive detection um, through that. And one of the key things that we learnt from that was it's not actually about identifying what the specific pest was. It was about seeing something that was unusual, it was not normal, um, and they needed to manage it. And so, um, I don't know how well you can see on the image here, but there's some whitening on the leaves here, and if they see anything like that, um, it rings alarm bells for them. And um, we were able to reach out through this network and actually um, provide surveillance information without our staff actually having to go out into the field, and we were able to do this quite rapidly. So in return for what some people would call free diagnostics, we actually get surveillance data, we get in-season disease intelligence, we have a network of advisors that runs both directions, and the other key thing that we get is area of freedom data. So that's what I want to touch on now. So this is the information that's provided at the end of the season. So this is general surveillance data where these advisors provide um, the region from where they're surveying, um, the area of crops or the number of paddocks that they've surveyed and the number of times they've done this throughout the season. So in 2017, the crop area in Victoria was estimated to be around 3 million hectares and we captured about 1.5 million of those hectares. So that's only about 50% um, in an average year we'll actually achieve around about 2 million hectares. So looking at the actual um, area of freedom information and how it's generated, one of the key steps was actually um, determining how likely it is that these advisors are able to detect some of these exotics. And so this was a independently run expert elicitation process and it was funded by the Agricultural Competitiveness White Paper. Um, and the uh, Melbourne University worked with a group of experts in this field to determine the likely probability of detection um, of a specific pest or disease by an agronomist given the symptoms and when this pest or disease could be detected. So this is um, in the far left column. And you can see here that for something like turnip moth, which has a very limited window of detection because it is an insect pest um, and it relates to flights and everything, there's a very, very low um, probability of detection compared to something like barley stripe rust, which can be present through most of the growing season. Um, it's on the leaves of the plant and it's very, very visible because it's a, um, it produces a yellow powdery-like substance on the plant leaves. So in order to determine the actual probability of freedom, these um, uh, probability of detection values are used um, in a scenario tree analysis. And if we have a look here, um, using a, the probability of um, freedom is determined through a scenario tree analysis and combined with Bayesian statistics and using American serpentine leaf miner as an example, the target crops are peas and beans. The number of target crops inspected here are 1,203, which is our surveillance units. So from that scenario tree analysis, these are the probabilities that an um, infected crop is detected. The crop status refers to one in 200 paddocks. The visual inspection is the ability of the agronomist to detect this. And then the other two values are the actual ability of the um, labs to detect this. When these are multiplied together, they give you um, a sensitivity unit. This itself is not that interesting, but what becomes interesting is when it gets taken further to become an overall sensitivity unit, and it, this is where the surveillance units become so important, and you can see that it actually goes up to 0.95. 
when this gets plugged into the Bayesian equation, the probability of freedom is actually quite high when compared to the actual um, ability of the, or what the experts believe the ability of the advisor is to um, detect this uh, pest. And if we extrapolate this information out um, to all the, or to those particular um, pests and diseases of concern, you can see how important that number of crops surveyed is when you compare the two far left columns with the probability of detection and probability of freedom, um, particularly for something like lentil rust or lupin anthracnose. You can see in that middle column there that the detection um, value is the same, but the number of crops surveyed is significantly different. And this isn't due to they're not going out and looking at lupin crops. This is because it's such a niche crop within Victoria and it's such a low number um, and lentils are much more widely grown, but it very much affects um, the probability of freedom. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind is that there's, because they provide the region-specific informa uh, region information as well, if we were to have an incursion within a part of Victoria, this data can actually still be used to declare um, area of freedom for areas where there's been no pest detected, so we can still generate these for um, uh, the other regions. So based on those figures, we can um, declare with 95% confidence that um, for most pests, and even higher than that for some, that Victoria is free of exotics, of those particular exotics. Um, and the surveillance information provided by the CropSafe program helps to maintain Victoria's status as being free of exotic pests and diseases for broadacre crops. Um, the key thing to remember is it's only through strong relationships with industry that the project is able to generate the data that it does. When I was putting together this presentation, um, Jess asked me to think about what uh, the greatest challenges and achievements, I suppose, would be for um, this project. It's probably the same thing. Um, currently, our project employs the equivalent of one, about one full-time staff. So we're able to survey um, most of Victoria's cropping region uh, on the smell of an oily rag. And this is only possible due to the people that are actually involved. So we have five people who have a wide range of um, roles, but we all have a different connection to industry. So we have someone who has um, expertise in statistics. We have someone who does diagnostics. We have someone who, um, we have people who have those direct industry contacts and um, build on those. And realistically, the project is only able to function as well as it does through um, collaboration. And this includes industry, the researchers that we run the training with. Um, so I'd like to finish um, by actually thanking everyone who supports this project in various different ways. The Horsham Pathology Group, because they provide um, training opportunities for these advisors. They also provide um, expert opinion on some of the diseases that come through the diagnostic lab. The CropSafe advisors, without whom this project actually wouldn't be possible. We've had advice from interstate colleagues who help out when there's something that's a bit trickier to diagnose or even to provide management advice. Um, and I'd also like to thank particularly Frank Henry, who was actually the, the diagnostician um, for CropSafe for a number of years. Thank you. Thank you.